This is The Law Show on CL 650. Now back to the show. Red Robinson and the Diner coming up at noon, but in the meantime, we have our lawyer guests from Maynard Kisher Stoichevich, immigration and citizenship lawyers here in Vancouver downtown at 1168 Hamilton Street. You can find them out uh, online, too, at vancouverlaw.ca. Gordon Maynard and Rudy Kisher are with us. We've been talking about all of these changes. Oh, so new, too. What is it, January 18th? Not even three weeks. The federal government has changed, once again, Canada's immigration system, and they've added on something called called the Express Entry Program for three categories of skilled workers. And, uh, uh, Gordon, you were talking moments ago about, uh, and I got the, I got the, the, uh, the acronym wrong, but I took a good shot at it, <laughs> the LMIA, the Labor Market Impact Assessment. This is now a requisite piece of, uh, of the, the document puzzle that one is required to submit to the Government of Canada uh, by way of applying to come to this country to work, correct? Almost. All right. The government will hesitate from saying that it's actually requisite. Oh, I see. It's really good to have one. Right. They won't say it's absolutely requisite. But on the new point system, it's worth major brownie points if you have it, and it can hurt you if you don't have it. That is correct. Okay. So, Rudy, how does that work if you are already in Canada uh, on some kind of work arrangement that may not necessarily um, uh, comply completely with these changes the government has made, and you want to stick around for a while? What happens then? Well, it can cause a, a big problem, I think, in trying to get out of the pool that we were talking about. Right, right. Because a, a lot of very highly skilled people come to Canada on work permits in different ways. Um, for example, they can come on what's called an intercompany transferee. So the person is a senior executive or a senior manager at a, at a company that has an affiliate company here, and he's brought over here to sort of impart his knowledge and his expertise over here in Canada, works here for several years, could be here for, for five, seven years, mm -hmm. and then he wants to immigrate. And the company wants to keep him here because he's done a great job in the company. He's increased the, the company's profitability, for example. And he comes to us and he says, you know, I'd like to immigrate. Can I? Um, and we look at this express entry system. The LMIA um, that we've been talking about gives him 600 out of the 1,200 points. He is not eligible to get those 600 points be right now because his company does not have an LMIA. So then we're stuck with, well, what do we do now? Should we try and get your company an LMIA to show that there's a, there's, a, there's a shortage? It puts it in a very difficult position because if you take a look at the requirements to get an LMIA, we have to advertise. Um, the company has to advertise in, in, in various locations for over a month period to say we can't find a Canadian. Meanwhile, this guy's been doing the job in for Canada se in for seven years. For seven years. Exactly, right. So the company definitely doesn't want to hire somebody. He's been doing a great job. And they want to keep him here, and they want to help him immigrate. But the system is set up that 50% of the points available aren't really available for this uh, individual unless they try and replace him, which is not what they want to do. Gordon, is this labor market impact assessment, this LMIA, basically a requirement for an individual to prove to the government of Canada that there's no one in Canada capable of doing the job that they want to come to Canada to do. Is that pretty much it? That, you know, in short, that's the essence of it. Okay. Remember that the LMIA, or LMO as it used to be called, was really a tool used not for immigrant selection, but for foreign workers coming initially into Canada. Should a company be allowed to hire a foreign worker rather than hiring a Canadian? And so the LMO process required the company to advertise and demonstrate that there was a need to bring in the foreign worker. Okay. It was not intended that the LMO would be a necessary requirement for that worker to become a permanent resident. And so we had a system that allowed people like intercompany transferees or other, other workers in Canada who didn't need LMIAs to transition to permanent residence. So, for instance, we have foreign students who come to Canada. Sure. They go, to, they go to high school here. They go to university pay here. Pay through they get the it. nose for the privilege. Oh, too, they pay they? big money for it. <laughs> yep. Uh, they get a degree here. They get a post-grad work permit. They work for a company. The company likes them. They want to keep them. Yep. Those people had a path to immigrate. Right. Under one the of these categories. Beginning as a student. 
Yeah, beginning as a student without having to go get an LMIA. Right. Uh, so now they've graduated, they've got a successful job, they've established a career, and they want to stick around. Right, and now they're told, your employer has to go out and get an LMIA for you to get that 600 points. Well, for somebody who is two years into the workforce, graduating from a university, the idea of saying that I can't find a Canadian to do this job is inconsistent with that individual because you're talking about really an entry-level job from a university graduate. You should be able to find a Canadian to do the job. Sure, of course. So what are we really trying to do here? Why are we using the LMIA as, a, as an overriding requirement for immigrant selection? It's inconsistent with the purpose. When you consider those people who have already integrated into Canadian well, society. Well, they're here, sure, yeah. Those are the ideal, if you want it, you, we, we talk about uh, bootstrapped immigrants, people that are already working in the system, are educated in Canada, speak the language. These are our ideal immigrants. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, for the employer to help this individual, the employer now has to say, we're going to try and replace you. We're going to genuinely try and replace you. So it's not enough to sort of repost some ads. They have to interview people. They have to show that no qualified Canadian you know, applied in the period of, let's say, 30 days, or there has to be an ongoing advertisement, so it could be a period of six months, to take this person's job. It just really, as Gordon said, you're taking a system that was meant to protect the Canadian labor market right. and then adding it to a system which is meant to help economically productive people come to Canada. It right. makes no sense. I mean, years ago, years ago, the government looked at the fact that who do we, you know, we want, we want economically sustainable immigrants. We sure. want immigrants who can come to Canada and hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want physicists driving taxis, right? So they said, where are we going to find these people? The best place to find them are people who are workers already in Canada. Sure. They're here on a temporary basis. We're going to transition them to permanent residence. Those are people who already have supporting employers. They've already demonstrated integration into society. And so that's why we had these programs develop, using students who had gone through school and found jobs in Canada, using people who had come through NAFTA agreements and other agreements that allowed them to have work permits in Canada and establish themselves here. Transitioning those people to permanent residence made perfect sense. Now we seem to be going backwards from okay. that. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to understand why. Why? And here we are in early January 2015. It's, a, it's an election year. We're likely to have an election this fall, although we may be surprised with one this spring. Either way, Canadians will vote in 2015 federally. Is this more politics, Rudy? Hey, we've changed the system. We've got express entry. Wow, are we on top of it now. Just t take a look at, at how we've expedited our immigration system. Is it more political than practical? I think there's a lot of politics uh, being played here. I think it would be naive to think that it's not. I think the government uh, today wants to be in a position when they're campaigning on the campaign trail this summer to say, Look what the Liberals had. They had a system where some people were taking five, seven years to immigrate. We have a system now that's running in place that's going to have applicants process from the time they actually submit an application. They're not going to talk about putting up the profile, mm -hmm. waiting on the profile, putting, get, waiting to get the invitation to apply. They're going to count the time period for when they actually get the application, not the other two hoops they've had to jump through, right. and say, we've processed that now in six months. Look what a great job we've, we've done with that. And in the meantime, because of all the scuttlebutt that happened this summer when you were seeing every week there was something in the media about workers at McDonald's that were getting abused under the foreign, you, you know, uh, foreign workers, that they've taken that and they're saying everybody here has gone through a new rigorous program. We've replaced the LMNO, which ran under the Liberals, that wasn't effective in sort of protecting Canadians. And now we've got this new labor impact assessment, which is more rigorous and is going to force employers to make sure they've looked for a Canadian. And that they're going to say, we we've mailed both of those. And that's why they're doing it. And I'm, I'm really glad you opened that door by mentioning McDonald's, because the implication there is that that person, that worker at, at that level is is, is, is an unskilled worker compared to an engineer who's going to work up in the yeah. oil field. Yeah. So when it comes to the express entry program, Gordon, you described the three categories of the economic class immigrants that this, this applies to. What about all of those unskilled workers, all of whom, well, many of whom are already here, and certainly now we're hearing about grand designs for many more uh, for mega projects uh, such as the LNG project here in British Columbia. Does any, uh, do any of these changes to the Immigration Act, effective two weeks ago, apply to any unskilled workers? No. The express entry is solely for skilled workers. That's uh, in their, we call it the classification system, national occupation classification, was described as zero A or B occupations. These are skilled worker jobs, right? And that's from whom we that's the pool from whom we select our economic immigrants. Okay. There really re hasn't been any program 
to allow low-skilled workers to obtain immigration, except for very special programs, very limited programs. And so the individual provinces are allowed to develop programs. If they think they have a low-skilled area and they want to attract workers into the province, they can offer nomination programs that will facilitate immigration for them. So this but might, that's on a province-by-province province basis. And this might be the mechanism which the government of British Columbia, for example, could use to bring large numbers of unskilled workers in to work on this specific project. Sure. A nomination by right. Victoria, right? Well, no, they'll, they'll use the LMIA process to bring them in as foreign workers. But it'll be up to each province to decide whether or not they will then allow transitioning of those workers into permanent resident status. Some provinces will, and many provinces won't. Okay. So many, many low-skill workers come here just as workers and don't have an opportunity to become permanent residents because they're not, they're not part of our selection picture. And, and the unfortunate problem with that is I don't think a lot of them, it's not made very clear to them how bleak their chances are in terms of if they come as unskilled labor to sort of graduate to that skilled category and right. hopefully qualify under one of these express entries. They're left hoping to qualify into one of these, as Gordon mentioned, these smaller programs that mm -hmm. are very specific. And all of them generally require a employer to nominate them. So the person comes to Canada working, let, let's say, at, at, at a McDonald's as a fast food server and has to hope that somehow that, that uh, depend on that employer out of the goodness of their heart saying, yeah, we'll nominate you and keep you here. Well, a lot of employers are, are good about this and very upfront, but I've seen some horrible cases in my office where people come here for years right. um, and are told, yeah, we'll, we'll nominate you next year. Well, let's see how it goes. They and they string stay, them along, they string them along them here along. for four years, if not longer, staying here, and they never get the nomination. Meanwhile, the person has left their family, you know, their children are at home, and they're, they're making some money to send back, but it's all on the dream that I'm eventually going to be able to come to Canada. Gordon? I, I just want to close off with a comment that I know that some government representative somewhere is going to challenge what we've said here today. Okay. They're going to say, you don't need an LMO or an LMIA for express entry. You can always get provincial nomination because that's also worth 600 points. Right, okay. The problem with that is it's putting enormous pressure on the province, which has very limited resources for nomination. I was just going to say, which with the exception of Quebec has very little to do with the immigration business at all. They, have a, they are only allowed to nominate a small portion. They've been given a little bit of resources to do express entry. Okay. But really, it's an unfair burden on them. And the, the processing time for PMP is going to rise because everybody's going to look at the point system. They're going to look at we need an LMIA or we need provincial nomination. They're going to force the province to take a role in that instead of them taking and, responsibility. And we're already seeing that happen with the provinces. What's happened for a program that used to run, let's say, two to three months from where you used to put in for an application for a certificate, in Alberta, it's now running two years. Two years to get a certificate. So you apply for the province saying, I'd like to immigrate. I'm working here in Alberta right. as a server. I think I fit one of your programs or here as a low skilled as a, as a food cutter or something, mm -hmm, sure. meat cutter. They would, uh, they're now waiting two years. Uh, in B.C., They've now received an increase since about June of 80% uh, increase in the applications. They don't have any resources or increased capacity to make decisions. So our times here have now gone from where they were running in two to three months. They're now running at 13 months. And that's a direct result of the changes to the LMIA program. Interesting stuff. Our guests are Gordon Maynard and Rudy Kisher from Maynard Kisher Stoichevich, immigration and citizenship lawyers right here in Vancouver. Thank goodness for that. We're back with more right after this. There's more of the show still ahead. This is The Law Show on CL 650.